ready to go to school. And who's your daddy? What do you think of what's going on right now, mate? These evil little invisible parasites. Satan worshipping Freemason moron. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're not run by factions. Get the fuck out of here! There are much more powerful international forces in play. Is this pink guy? Is this what pink guy is? I don't fucking know what's happening. Please get outside and look at the moon quickly. It's been crazy, guys, but guess what? It's how it is, mate. Mate, because I want to do this one. But I ain't spending any time on it. Welcome to the Conditional Release Program, a podcast that delves into the nether world of cults, crims, and con artists. I'm Jack the Insider, otherwise known as Peter Hoisted for tax purposes. And I'm Joel Hill, and this episode is brought to you by Medazolam. Medazolam. What? Joel, you aren't allowed to take big pharma money. It's illegal to advertise pharmaceutical drugs in Australia. Yes, I know, but we are incorporated in Delaware, so we can we actually do whatever the fuck we want. It's, safe, it's a loophole. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, so it's a good place to make companies. Now, Medazolam comes in several delicious flavors and promises mm. to give you the end of life experience you deserve. Is life getting you down due to multiple organ failure? Medazolam's what you're after. Hold on, Medazolam, not my Dazolam. Did you fuck up the pronunciation last week? Last episode. Don't you fucking throw stones in that glass house, Mister Insider. Oh. You know, you know yeah, what you did. You wrote it. <laughs> Look, I fucked it up too, but uh, you insisted you were correct, and that makes you the bigger dickhead. It kind of does. It kind of does. Anyway, look, fine. But the end of life drug we discussed last episode was Medazolam. I think I'm. I think I don't even know if I'm getting that right yet. So, good friend of the podcast, healthcare John, gave us a good serve for this. And we got several letters politely explaining that we did screw this up. We've got tons of healthcare workers in the ranks, which is great. We really appreciate the feedback. And we did also get one to the TRC, uh, TCRP Facebook page, which kind of vanished. I don't know, whoever sent that, we didn't ignore you. Did it get deleted? Oh, fuck. Don't know. I, would, I didn't delete nothing. Yeah, sure. So it's Medazolam, okay? We got the core of it right So I, once I started Googling. And according to our COP friends, as Joel mentioned, who are medical experts, it's a commonly used anti-anxiety drug in anesthesia and is sometimes used as a part of various drugs given at end of life. And due to the horrible nature of COVID death, this wonderful little drug has helped a lot of people die with some dignity. But cookers, including the ultimately cooked clown who put this study together, suggesting that doctors were just executing people, uh-huh. uh, claim, you know, basically claimed that people didn't die of a rampaging respiratory infectious disease like COVID-19, but because the docs put them down for fun or sport or something, maybe vivisection. Yes, yes, organs are good. So yeah. The drug where it is used as an end of life, uh, it's part of a multiple drug strategy, we were told, not, is, to, yeah. not to end life, just to be clear on that, yes. uh, but to make one entering their ends of life as comfortable as possible. That's exactly it, and that is a good thing. Um, I want to be really, really high if I'm in that position because everything would suck. So... End of life treatment will be a harrowing process for our frontline workers as well, who like maybe they're not dying, but they're still like, you know, battling with this thing of looking death in the eye every day with COVID still killing people, despite nobody actually really giving a shit about it in, anymore in the media or wherever. But medicating a person into their final stages will be fucking intense, and our heroic scrub wearing legends need to be given more love for their work. And not threatened with hanging. Yes. Not threatened with hanging. That's a very important point you made. Um, that's not great. Anyway, it's an opportune time to remind you that this episode is not actually brought to you by Medazolam, but by CB Co. Beer, which is a delicious way to enhance your palliative care experience. And if you're about to go, it's got to be CB Co. <sighs> well, it rhymes, but it's not funny, Joel. Well, look, you know, I'm, I'm working with what I got, all right? I got prompts. So, fine. I won't make a joke about this, but we do have a Patreon and it really does help. We haven't had much time to publish recently. I understand that because we have had to find other means of gainful employment and they take time and effort and that sucks. So if you'll be kind enough to pitch in, that would help. Maybe alleviate some pressure. Maybe we can do a bit more podcasting. And to our existing patrons, you are helping. What you do really takes the edge off and we thank you so much for your support. Uh, All right, Joel, that's enough of that. You're driving me to benzo abuse. Uh, nobody likes a benzo addict because we've got a big show to put together, including cookers cooked in cars, killing, or is that the cars that are cooked? No, no, it's the cookers who are cooked <laughs> and their cars, well, we can't be absolutely certain. 
they may be cooked as well, but they're causing a lot of trouble on our roads at the moment. And we've got soft sits, folks. We've got soft sits, com- soft sits coming out of our ears. Yeah, so many you- soft sits. And where's your jurisdiction, Joe? Good question. I'm glad you're not hitting the benzos because you wouldn't have time to do any of this. But we don't have time for any more of this because it's time for the Conditional Release Program's weekly news. So, Jack, what is the cause of fatalities on the road? Uh, apparently, it's casual speeding. No. Fatigue? Main drivers? No. Monster truck drivers on crystal meth are rampaging yes, not- around our streets. It's got to be worth something. Well, it's in there, but it's not it. Right, Jack, mate, you're missing the obvious. It's cooker culture. Really? I fucking love this. So this is a cracking little nugget of bizarre political communication from our very good friend Mark Southcott, the dreaded keeper of the keys. keys. He sent Mm. us this link from the ABC who reported on the 22nd of February that New South Wales Roads Minister John Graham has been investigating a rise in the road toll, which is very sad, and I don't want to be too jovial about this, but the cause is great. He reckons he may have found a root cause of the problem. Jack? Mr. Graham said he was also investigating the role of individual driver behaviour. A small section of our community became used to questioning the rules during COVID and in some cases outright flouting them, Mrs. Mr. Oh. Graham said. It only takes a handful of individuals on our roads ignoring the road rules to make it far more dangerous for every one of us and could be reflected in our road toll. As Mr. Mm. Graham said that. Last year, Australia had its highest road death toll since 2019. And experts say one way to bring it down is better data. Uh. The call comes after deaths in, in Sydney's northwest, the Riverina and Central West. And Mr. Graham said the department was researching the problem and said cookers, people who think rules do not apply for them, were part of the problem. I want to be clear, Graham said. We will not accept cooker culture on our roads. Well, there you have it, folks. It's cookers. Now, I'm a bit reluctant to blame a rising road toll on cookers and their, you know, tantrums and distaste for authority. But on the other hand, blaming car accidents on sobsits and cookers is quite funny. It is quite funny. They are scoff laws, Joel, which is a very they American a term for people who scoff at laws. So yeah. if they scoff at laws around lockdowns, for example, maybe they they scoff at those big red circles that say 50 or yes. 60. Mm. Yes, yes. And also, um, generally speaking, are responsible for car accidents that then result in there being no insurance for the injured because they don't have CTP. No, that is a sort of thing. I, you can't think of a worse nightmare, motor, vehicle, motor vehicular accident-wise, where no one is hurt, touch wood, than hitting a, you know, being involved in a collision with a soft seat. You're not getting the money for that. You are not getting your money for that. No, that is – and it, it's their fault. Fuck you. It doesn't matter. So yeah, talk to your insurance company, but um, but yeah, and press hard that it's a no fault claim. It yeah, would be very funny if there was actually an insurance claim, uh, an insurance I mechanism was hit on by the phone. A cooker. Yeah, no, but that like, and dial five if you <laughs> were in an accident <laughs> yes. with a sovsit or it's, a cooker. It's a box to tick. You cooker got the related claims accident. department. Are you a cooker, or just just generally, are you vaccinated? And if the answer is no, you just go. Oh, okay, your premium may be a little bit higher. Mm, now, there you go. Yahoo News is a website that still exists, and I'm amazed. <laughs> Real throwback yeah, to the Yahoo 2000s, though. exists is is the, the more I'm amazing stunned. thing. I am stunned, but they did a little good. Uh, they elaborated on this quite nicely, so they yeah. went on to explain this. New South Wales Road Minister John Graham said so-called cookers, a disparaging term for people with fringe anti-authority views. Is it a fair term to use in the media, Joel? Look, I like the fact that they used it. That's why I was getting the – because obviously Yahoo's stating the obvious. This isn't exactly news. I just like the fact that they went, you know what, we're just going to go with it. We're just going to go with it. And and I I, Well, the minister used it. And I I love that when they say cookers, when they write it in their news pieces – Everyone knows what they're talking about. Well, that's what's ha- that's why we keep on using sovsits. I mean, yes, they are pseudo law inherent, and there are various other things we can go into. But sovsits is just so catchy, you know. It's fun, and we're having fun here, right? Yeah. So they flouted the rules, 
This is this is Graham's theory. The New South Wales Road Minister John Graham. This is his theory. Because cookers, who we might think he's actually caught, he's actually misrepresenting soft sits again, um, but just generally cookers, I think he's going for. They flouted yep. the rules during the COVID nineteen pandemic, and we're now doing so on the state's roads with catastrophic consequences. That's not Ooh. a quote from him. That's the Yahoo That's news Yahoo. piece. Uh, yes. Citing evidence from New South Wales Centre for Road Safety, Mr Graham said it was possible that just 3% of drivers were responsible for 25% of road incidents. I'm glad yeah, they don't call I mean, them accidents because it's, often it's not an accident. Yeah, it's incident. That actually that checks out. I, I feel you. But I do think it's interesting because there's no such thing as a coincidence. And the fact that cookers tend to get around 3% of the vote, yeah. I mean, clearly he has done some research here. I mean, it's... It's that's no coincidence. Yeah, it I think, does seem uh, like I think he's got the three percent down, right? Between three and five, we would think maybe. Yeah, maybe yeah, yeah closer to three than five. Sometimes point three in the uh, example of maybe Guru and Bozy, but uh, look, we can't mm. all get three percent. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot to ask for. Well, yes, indeed it is. And generally speaking, it gets you into the upper house in New South Wales. But anyway, well, <laughs> it can. It can in certain circumstances. <laughs> But Graham went on and he said, but we are concerned post-COVID that we're seeing people who might have ignored the rules during COVID and might have flouted the rules during COVID doing so on our roads. Ooh, they're just not messing up now. They were messing up before. Ooh. The question is, he said, post-COVID, do we have a smaller number of drivers flouting the rules? He's asking questions, really. A very small number questions. of people might be responsible for a large number of incidents. I suspect that's yeah. pretty right, but I don't yeah. think that it's. I don't think it's all cooker related. But I think he's throwing. Well, I mean, throwing all the eggs in one research? basket there. Have you done any research into this? Are you well, the roads it, it minister? It, no, I haven't. But it doesn't look like he's done a whole lot either. <laughs> <laughs> Must be said. I jest. This is ridiculous. It, it, it is. It is a little bit silly. And he's probably got cookers on the mind. He may well be a listener. <laughs> he may well be a listener. And if he is, bless you. Uh, well, you know, we'll see you yeah, on Thursday. We're, we're but, really, um, we're really sorry. We radicalised you. <laughs> <laughs> It could have been Tanaki, you know. I don't think we should take all responsibility for this. So the message here is to avoid any cars covered in cooker shit. Even a little RDA sticker on the back window is a massive red flag. You're about yep. to be viciously attacked by a ton of steel and a traveller who does not consent to you being alive. He's not driving. Uh, He's not driving. No, no, no. He's so traveling. Can- that's they're traveling into you at speed. So uh, continuing from the Yahoo article, take it away. Uh, Mr. Graham said, a worrying disregard for road rules involved drivers refusing to wear seatbelts, excessively speeding, and even handing in their num- number plates using the argument they were sovereign citizens and not subject to laws. 17% of people, Graham said, have been killed because they're not wearing their seatbelts. And my view is a seatbelt is not a restraint on your civil liberties, he said. <laughs> if it's a result of cooker culture, we want to know and we'll take action. Ooh, foreboding so words. Go. I mean, it looks like action's already been taken and problem solving itself, right? Cookers aren't wearing seatbelts. Yeah. You know. That's that's kind of nature taking its course. Who's not wearing seatbelts these days? I mean, most cars will just create an awful noise you you. <laughs> if you're yeah. not wearing your seatbelt. Often it gets down to overcrowded in, overcrowding in cars where seatbelts are not available. Yes. I'm um, where you've got six before. or seven people in a car that uh, is built for four or five yep. uh, and only has that number of belts. So I think that would that would be a fair chunk of that 70% of people. But, yeah. That's a very reasonable thing. I mean, look, you know, uh, we've got to go down. We've got to yell at a building. There's seven of us. We've only got five seats in the car. I, mean, I remember when seatbelts came in and there were these arguments. I mean, there weren't – oh, yeah. can you imagine it come, happening now? Um, oh, God. And the, uh, I, I refuse to wear my seatbelt as you go straight through the windscreen, um, yeah. basically decapitating yourself. And going, yeah, it's still happening. I, I died a free man. Yeah. Well, you know, you've got that going for you. And let's face it, I mean, God knows what's going through their brains and they think, you know what, seatbelts? optional yeah. anyway bless them look i'll just say as a general rule steer clear of cookers on the road and don't worry they identify as themselves fairly clearly usually with either right-wing trash scrawled across their car and in, in marker 
or, of course, stickers and, let's face it, actual red flags, which is uh, very helpful. You can also shitty cars. Away. You don't see too many Ooh. in Audis. Ooh, not I too know. many in Maybachs. Not too many in Mercs. You know, you just you got know, a nice car. We've well, got so a better is, quality yeah. of people there, obviously. Well, yeah. Look, I'm not a. I'm not going to class this. My car is a piece of shit. But what I can say is that they don't tend to care about roadworthiness, and I am very particular about making sure that there my car you go. doesn't. I think that was the point I was trying to make, but I was just getting caught. I was hoping that a, you know, sort of Audi dealership was listening in, and would get get hold of me and say, Jack, we'd like you to have a new Audi. I've made it very clear I will sell out at the drop of a hat. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. The dingle of those yeah. keys will just, yeah, I'll, I'll start. I'll be a conspiracy theorist. Anyway, back to Yahoo. Uh, data compiled by Ipsos to track attitudinal changes post-COVID and presented to a road safety forum in Sydney in February highlighted an increase in what the research firm termed disconnected drivers. The mm. cohort, aged mainly between 25 and 39, had a risk profile with issues related to speeding, mobile phone use, and drink driving. Okay. Now, hold on a second. Between 25 and 39 years, fellas, guys, Ipsos, please, no. Well, I'm sure the data is solid and you've done all your research and Johnny Gragra surely knows that cookers basically start at 50. Maybe you should have told Ipsos that. Yeah. Sure, Jesse Stewart and Beck Freedom exist and they're in their 20s or whatever. I don't know. But if you look at the wider cooker demographic, it's a bit fucking grey. Well, I think I think we're looking at an altogether different demographic, not based on age, Joel. I think we're looking at people who've got an enormous number of stickers on their review, uh, rev, on their on their rear glass, on their rear yes. windows. There's and very that's little got, visibility. That's got to be a vision problem. Got to be. It's got to be a vision problem. That and the fact they've got cataracts. I mean, it's <laughs> two sides of a similarly dangerous coin. So look. I do look forward to seeing the results of the Cookers on Road investigation, and if we hear about it, we will let you know. I would absolutely love to see an APS contract put out on a recruitment site that says, Cooker researcher, required to look at the impact of Cookers on the Road toll. And if that job does exist, I absolutely want one of their business cards. Well, the insurance company would be all over it. The companies would be all over it. The whole industry would be all over it. If you're a cooker. Press five if you were hit by a we're cooker. We're putting 25% on top of your premium. Yeah, yeah, pretty fair. Not that they'd pay. Eric Trump, the good-looking boy of the Trump empire, now known as Mr. Lara Trump because his mm-hmm. wife is of more use to the Donald than... Eric is, has been ignored by his dad, who he loves. But as we know, it's never reciprocated. And this story, going back a few weeks ago now, uh, was when the uh, the Donald was on the campaign trail in South Carolina. Yeah, this is from Business Insider, which says, former President Donald Trump forgot to name one of his children during his victory speech (laughs) after securing the Republican primary nomination in South Carolina on Saturday, despite standing on stage with them. I mean, he just doesn't see him. He was he actually reading him. from a list. He, yes, he Because <laughs> they'd actually gone, look, he's going to forget some people. So he's yeah. going to forget some of his kids. So we'll People'll hand a him a list. That, and he there does. he was looking down and up. So that's how we know. Yeah. First of all, my family, Melania, Baron, Don Jr. and Kimberly, Ivanka and Jared, Tiffany and Michael, they are so, so supportive, <laughs> so supportive of me. And we really appreciate it and love them. We have a great family, Trump said. He neglected to mention his second son, Eric Trump, <laughs> who loves his dad, and his wife, Lara, standing on stage to his right. They were there. Now, they were right there. <laughs> Eric, 40, is the executive vice president of the Trump organization. And by that, I mean, um, what's that called? Scapegoat, uh, uh, well, the holding yeah. company for many of Trump's business ventures and investments. Yeah, he's uh, he's getting a lot of subpoenas. Uh, look. Mrs. Lara Trump is back in the good books after being named co-chair of the RNC, a nepotistic Trump appointment if ever there was one. And this Uh arose while stories emerged from ex-Trump tattletale Michael Cohen, who said in a podcast (laughs) that when Lara Trump first joined the family and became betrothed to Eric by pouring a bottle of Pfizer Hex over his head in a loving ceremony at (laughs) Mar-a-Lago, it was a bit plain for the Donald's liking. She was a bit, you know... He's, he's not root worthy, I think he was probably saying, like, like his daughter yeah. is, you know, or yeah. jump in a hot tub, <laughs> promiscuous Kimberly Guilfoyle, you know, that yeah. that sort of style and glamour she was missing. 
that there is a spicy broad, what can you do? So even Miss Lara Trump is back in the good books now. So what of Eric, Mr. Lara Trump? What of the good-looking boy? What will we do well, with him? I think Mr. Lara Trump has been getting by on his good looks for too long, Joe. True. It's not True. all show. It's not all show and blow on the Trump empire. And maybe Mr. No. Lara Trump fell out with his dad, who he loves, when his dad Love asked him dad. for a loan of five hundred million, and all, yeah. and all Larry could could do was give him all the lighter fluid he had on him at the time, which was a lot. Which was a lot. Yeah, that's that's why he probably got fair. knocked back. Have you got five hundred yeah. million on your son? You know what's your name? And he's gone. No, Dad. <laughs> so he's just been brushed. Well, Jack, I think it's about time that Eric, sorry, Mr. Lara Trump, Mr. Lara Trump, learned that life is just simply not a free ride. Bit of tough love. Bit of tough love for Mr. Lara Trump. Love you, Dad. <laughs> and in other cooker adjacent news, Sarah Dankett wrote up an excellent piece in the Sydney Morning Herald after the Australian pseudo bank. Credit Net Bank Internazionale. Ooh, fancy. And its founder, Robert Bruce Gray, was slapped by APRA, the Australian financial regulator, and told quite sternly not to be calling themselves a bank and to pay APRA's costs. Good luck getting the money, guys. Yeah. Maybe they'll, no, maybe they'll do that. it in Bitcoin. Yes, uh, maybe in VivaCoin, which uh, comes <laughs> yeah, up later. One of those run there. Not Bitcoin, one of the really shitty ones. Yep, they literally call them shit coins. It's uh, it's great. So after reading this article, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole, and there may or may not be an episode coming on this soon. I've got a lot of tabs saved, but we don't have time right now because this episode would never have been released. The Sydney Morning Herald article states that the so-called bank has no office. This is Credit Net International, merely a mailing address at a unit in Broadbeach on the <laughs> Gold Coast. However, that's not quite true. The legitimacy of the bank is partially derived from an association with an address at a micronation named Caledonia Australis. Ooh. So that, that opened that up a whole fair, new income. rabbit hole. Oh, man, I was burrowing into it. But like I said, if I do this, the episode will never get finished and you will think that we are both dead. So here are the basics of the whole thing. So Credit Net Bank International claims that it is backed by a bunch of gold. <laughs> you know, like it, it, exactly, it's fancy. This is, this is it's a fancy bank. And this is what they say. They say, our asset base has been rated as double A plus Ooh. under the protocols of the AACRAA. Whoa. A, Where do I invest? Exactly in yeah, true. Oh, don't worry. I'll help take your money. And it's considered by industry standards as being significant in value. Ooh. Significant. So I Googled the AACRAA and the website still exists. What a miracle. So I'm paying the, uh, it's legit. Paying the hosting fees. Yeah. Um, so it's got very strong GeoCities vibes, if you know what I mean. It's got a real sort of like under construction 2002 <laughs> sort of uh, vibe to it. And uh, the only references to this online when you put that acronym into Google is um, uh, Credit Net International. And another cook venture called Amrock Trust, but we're not going down the rabbit hole, so we're not going to talk about that. From what I've read, it appears that Credit Net International, you know, with the E on the end, International. Intel, International. Oh, come to the bar, I'll buy you a beverage. Uh, this makes it fancy in European, obviously. Uh, what they do is they sell fake bills of exchange, which are said to be underwritten by their vast asset base, Ooh. which is verified by a website that was made on GeoCities. I'm convinced oh. already. I mean, yeah, take my money, right? <laughs> Apparently, some people have fallen for this. So as per usual, the dollar amounts on these fake documents are wildly high, just like Canberra saw 5 million cookers turn up a little while ago. The Sydney Morning Herald reports that an American man attempted to swindle 15 billion euros from the Micronesian state of Palau. And I'm just going to say here, man, what kind of a fucking asshole picks on Palau of all places? Yeah, well, look, 15 billion euros, not that this was successful, but 15 billion euros is 18% of Palau's GDP per annum. 217 million greenbacks is their, is their GDP per annum. That oh, was no. Our 2022 figures. So, yeah, pretty fucking nasty. You're actually so taking 20% taking of their economy away. This isn't 15 million. This is 15 billion with a 15 B. 15 billion euros. Well, oh my, my God, look, yes, I do understand the problem now. That is actually now, we go, that is 180 times. 
yep. <laughs> um, the, the Palau's uh, GDP. So it's just not very nice. It's not very nice. It's not it's very not nice. Very and nice. it's going to knock that country on its ass if it ha- had it happened. I mean, that'd Fucking be the first Palau. thing. You know, I, I know we're not talking about sort of bank tellers here, but that'd be the sort of thing saying, oh, the um, the uh, the nation of Palau. Let's have a bit of a look at it. Uh, yeah, let's, let's pull it up it on Google. Let's have a look on Wikipedia. And you'll let's have fuck a with them. look at it and see 15 billion euros is probably more than they, than the entire population has in the bank. Probably more. Yep. yep, yeah, problematic. I guess, you know, you pick on the little ones and see what happens, right? But Jesus Christ, mate, say 15 million. You could have probably got that and just, you know, Ruined the lives of many people on a small island, yeah, uh, as opposed yeah. to just being embarrassed publicly like you have. Anyway, I hope that person went to jail. So, in a more amusing attempt to take advantage of this fictitious financial instrument, not everyone's picking on the small guys because in 2006, former winemaker Andrew Garrett attempted to take over Foster's, yes, that Foster's, Qantas, BHP, and Suncorp using these bullshit bills of exchange. Well, BHP was and, and remains the, the biggest public company in. in- in uh, in the country, of course, yeah, and Foster's I mean, like, uh, I, just I, cooked. Foster's are all foreign owned, but Foster's, of course, so they'd be in the top ten. Suncorp would be in the top ten or twenty, definitely. Yeah, so oh, yeah, I'll just buy them with these pieces of paper. Yep, exactly. But the thing that's great is like you try your luck, right? You rock up. You go to the board and say, look, I want to take over the company. I've got plenty of cash. I've got, I've, got, absolute- I've got these things that I've just run over, run out on the photocopier. We have significant asset value underwriting these bills of exchange. I can show you the website that has certified it. I mean, <laughs> come on, man. We've got this. We've got the this pe- suite. The people of Palau are right behind us. And, like, and the thing is, like, you look at this situation, right, and Westpac sort of go, oh, bro, I don't reckon this is legit. So maybe we oh, won't. Mate. Ha- you know, maybe we won't organise a takeover of our um our company to you. Uh, yeah, I don't think we're really we're, going to go through this. That's seventeen billion dollars you're after. We, have you got any collateral besides the photocopy documents? No, we've got vast assets. It's verified by the <laughs> website. Keep up. So Garrett was so fucking convinced this deal was legit. I mean, this guy is baked to perfection. He sued Westpac in the federal court for failing to honour the documents. Ooh. That is so ballsy. Well, yeah, so, like, but how did it work out? Well, not well. I mean, unsurprisingly, Westpac won the case, and when the uh, court couldn't quite establish the legitimacy of Credit Net Bank International. Well, did they pronounce it correctly? And maybe that was the well, that, problem. Did they pronounce I mean, I it issue. Credit Credit Net Bank International? Yeah, or, the legitimacy is because in that, if they you know. didn't, it, it it just wouldn't have worked. And hilariously enough, Gray, uh, the proprietor and founder, and uh, probably the webmaster of uh, the organisation, told the Sydney Morning Herald that this was actually an error at law. Um, oh. Yeah, those pesky judges always making those dumb uh. mistakes. And Credit Net Bank Internationale had lawfully issued the documents. What a double down. Just so brazen. Yeah, look, uh, the, the next step, of course, is suing for defamation. Um, just like oh, um, just like uh, Ben Robert Smith did. And, and Just do it. Did, that just, just worked it. out perfectly, didn't it? We need content. Just do it. So despite the spectacular failure of this bizarre use of fraudulent documents to take over some of the largest companies in Australia and the world, as mentioned, Garrett decided he was onto a good thing and kept on going. Don't don't Why be not? dissuaded by a loss. They're temporary setbacks. That's right. That's Can't right. keep a good soul sit Push down. Push on. So this resulted in him actually making an offshoot using the same principle himself. And due to what appears to be truly believing his own bullshit, and I really do believe this guy believes his own bullshit, he was declared a vexatious litigant in 2009. Aww. Aww. And that's not easy to do. It's really not. It it's be really easier. not easy to do. It just, it, it, um, it's crazy. We've and, got the yeah. snapping turtle. He's one. There aren't many. Yeah. Was Cullerton declared? No, he hasn't been declared. He'd be, he'd be staring down the barrel of it, but um, just but, incredible. But Wayne Glue was. You can see, like Billy Bay, um, you know William Bay, the uh, he'd you know, be, former he'd doctor. He'd be getting close. He, they've got to be talking about it because he just keeps on sending letters to the High Court. They keep on having to be really nice about it and just saying, "Look, would you please fuck off? You're not. Yeah. There's no. It's there's no not, basis it's for not this. A fish and chip shop, you know. I mean, it, it, yeah. It's it's, it's the, the High, High Court. Court of Australia. Yeah, it's not great. So, look, the Sydney Morning Herald article was prompted by the recent action from APRA where Gray decided not to defend the case at all. Um, Cool move. So the Sydney Morning Herald reports he was unrepresented, but it should be made clear, I think, that he did not participate in the proceedings at all. 
and ignored all requests from APRA to stop pretending to be a bank in the lead up to the case. Where's your so jurisdiction? Hand, Where's your jurisdiction? Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, Caledonia Australis, apparently. <laughs> so in classic Sobsit style, he told the City Morning Herald he was unable to properly defend himself due to personal circumstances. This is what he said. Between the last two-way emailed letters of communications that Credit Net Bank Internationale had with APRA and recent events taken place in the federal court, all in caps for some reason, I was kidnapped <laughs> and held for ransom. Ooh, classic. People are plow. They never forgive. Uh, yeah, <laughs> after right. paying the ransom funds, I was released and ended up being hospitalised for an emergency operation. I remember reading this. No documents were ever served on me to give me a chance to declare the truth, in inverted commas for some reason, of the status of Credit Net Bank Internationale to the court. Let's face it, that is just classic soft shit shit. It is. Who kidnapped you? What? And you, like, what did you pay the ransom funds? What, with a fucking bill of exchange? Verified by a GeoCities <laughs> website? Psycho. Just, I'll get that ransom together. Have you got a photocopier I can use? Uh, would you like BHP or Qantas? I mean, the <laughs> BHP makes a lot of money, but the Qantas yeah, have lovely Qantas lounges. Qantas fly anywhere. All really yeah. cheap. Imagine Basically, the, imagine the points you'll point. get. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very good. So, Arbor also took action against Garrett, the winemaker, who was doing very similar insane things under the name of Dynamic Capital Bank, Bank de Capital Dynamique. Ooh, which is, I like a bonk it, it is, Jack. Isn't it good? Bonk. Yeah, he did. He did. He, yeah, he bonked bonk it. Bonk de yeah, Capital Dynamique. True. Yeah. I mean, making it sound French uh, makes it French, I guess. I mean, like, what? what does that like, does that make it real well, somehow? Well, maybe anyway. even monogast, Joel. Maybe that's what he's tipping at uh, there. He's just gone uh, gone for the Kingdom of Monaco sort of reference yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, either way, ba-bow, you don't just get to call yourself a French bank and be a French bank. <laughs> the Banque de Capital Dynamique. Yep. We're, we're situated in France on the Gold Coast. Um, so, <laughs> it was, oh, fuck. This is such a dumb story. We, we don't do cash withdrawals. Please, please that, don't ask. No, no, but we do have a vast array of uh, assets, which uh, we can, uh, we can show you. Uh, not yeah. in person, but uh, we have photos. Don't reverse we, we, Google search them, Yeah, please. if you just sort of knock on a door in the Goldie, we, we can't give you any cash. No, no. Now, one of my favorites is his uh, subsidiary, Banca de Como. Banca um, de now, Como. I, Ooh. It sounds Italian. In, but I'm going to go with the fact that it is actually the lakeside town south of Sydney in what, Scomo's old electorate, isn't it? In well, Cork, yeah, it could be. Bank of Como, that checks out more yeah. than Italy. I mean, <laughs> I don't think it's, it sounds is. sounds like it should be on Lake Como. Yeah, well. But, not, but it's know, not. You just see this little floating yacht with Bank of Como <laughs> on it out there. It's fucking ridiculous. Gurus on it. As with any court case involving Sobsits, the judge had a nice swipe at the four winemaker with Justice Lee saying this in court. God bless Justice Lee. As will already be evident, Mr. Garrett's claims are not legally compelling. Aww. Indeed, to borrow an expression from a case involving claims not dissimilar to those in the present case, they resemble a jumble of gobbledygook. <laughs> This is self-evident, and I do not propose to waste time dealing with the allegation, I am a bankrupt. That's Justice uh -huh. Lee. <laughs> That's yep. Justice Lee of the Federal Court. That's I am a I bankrupt, love. nor explain why I consider the better view is that I should not be imprisoned in Outer Mongolia or some <laughs> such place. <laughs> Misprision of treason. God. Sorry, good. God love Sorry, you, good. Justice Lee. I love it. It's great. So- the hijinks didn't quite stop there because Garrett is well and truly cooked. According to Lee's judgment, Garrett also filed documents in that case that referred to the judge and APRA's legal team as, and I quote, prisoners. <laughs> Fuck's sake. And drew up a table that assigned them prison numbers. That is <laughs> so, Justice so Lee, your, shit. Your prisoner, 10703047. You know, I yeah. mean, my God. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll actually be curious to know what the number is. So, look, I think Garrett's going to be one of the funniest people we ever look at. And if I have some time, I really want to jump in here. God but continuing it. on with the uh, truncated uh, version of this without going down the rabbit hole, Garrett also holds that he was denied procedural fairness and said this to the sitting Poor morning Margaret. herald. Of course he was. Just, yeah, I mean, look, you just have to say, I'll, I'll get on with this quote, but look, if you're going to call a federal court judge who's actually hearing your case a prisoner and give and, a prisoner number you know, <laughs> and, and with a prison number <laughs> then a bit of maybe things aren't going to work out all that well for you anyway this no. is what he said this is Garrett. No. the proceedings uh the proceedings were commenced in a manner 
that was rushed. <laughs> it was not fair to the judge or me. Oh, he's just cutting or, yeah. Justice Lee some slack. At That's that nice. time, I was recovering from surgery and was incapable of making any submissions whatsoever and explained that to the judge. Uh huh. I have now filed and served a notice of removal to the High Court of Australia under S38A with a judicial officer nominated by the Chief Justice of the High Court of SAR. Hong Kong. Uh huh. Okay. Cool. So that's fine. So there's there's there's, yeah. ju- there's jurisdiction right there. Completely fucking normal behaviour, right? Yeah. Uh, and the High Court of Hong Kong, Joel, does it have yeah. a High Court? I, I don't, don't even know. Think it does. <laughs> he said Section Thirty Eight A, but lots of laws have Section Thirty Eight A. There will so be quite I don't a few. know. Uh, yeah, and the Chief Justice of the High, I did have a quick look at this, Joel. The Chief Justice of the High Court of uh, S A R. Hong Kong. What? I don't know what the SAR is supposed to stand for, but there is no Chief Justice of the High Court in Hong Kong because there is no High Court. Oh, technicalities, technicalities. Yeah, well, I'm sick. They I'm should sick. have one. They should have no, one. No, 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 no. I'm too busy having surgery. I can't address any of this. <laughs> so, <laughs> fucking idiot. Anyway, so this may be linked to the claim on his LinkedIn that he is dun, 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 the liquidator and managing controller of the world <laughs> and the role of Crown Attorney General in Hong Kong since 2020. Wow. Okay. I'm so sure the, the People's Liberation. <laughs> I'm sure the Chinese Communist Party would be interested in all this. Yeah, I'm sure. Or not interested at all because this guy is nuts. So I did have a look at his LinkedIn because that sort of prompted me to have a little look and wow. Managing controller of the world. It's a big title. I, I mean, mean, you know, how do you how do you get that job? One of many. One of many. And like I said, I'm no, not going down the rabbit hole because we're not spending roles. an hour on this. But I could. Oh, I could. There's so much going on here. Apparently he's in Riyadh, like in Saudi Arabia and hasn't quite gotten around to changing his LinkedIn profile from being a consultant at his own bank well, to not being man. a bank anymore. But, like, he calls himself a comp- consultant. Usually these guys big note themselves and say, oh, you know, CEO and managing controller of the world at my bank. <laughs> but he's like, <laughs> no, I'm just a consultant, mate. Just, just a consultant. I'm a lowly consultant. I don't, I don't deal with the executive manners. I'm not in the C-suite. I'm not the chairman's lounge. So the thing with the bank is that it never was a bank. So no. it's very challenging to watch this in motion, but it is a bit of a car crash and it is caused by a cooker. So we're staying on trend here, aren't we? I think he might be a little bit stubborn to change this. And I think that APRA's uh, judgment may fall on uh, deaf ears. Yeah, uh, and his GeoCities websites, of which there are several, will unlikely be changed either. And, of course, unsurprisingly, as we said, there is a dodgy crypto project on there. Crypto? Yeah. Why wasn't I told? He's shitcoin merching. I don't know what the – it's Viva coin. I just – no, anyway. But there's also the Better World Future Fund, which, if you Google it, only brings up the winemaker. And yet, apparently, they have 165 officers worldwide. Sure they do, Andy. Sure you do. Yeah, yeah, they do. cool. They do. They do. They do. They and, definitely do. And, and, and look, you know, if you want to make a better world, you just drink more wine. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that makes sense to me. He knows how to make it. Maybe um, but you should look, go back to doing that. I, I just want to get back to the Bitcoin, or not the Bitcoin, but the- uh, but The, the Viva the, coin? Well, whatever it is, is it, it just sounds wonderful. And, and and if it was known that the liquidator and managing controller of the world was behind it, Joel, I think everyone would jump on. The website is very funny. There's a thing in on the website that basically says they're going to explain it right and like with these things this whole sort of blockchain thing and blah 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 they're quite complex right so you have this thing where it's like okay you've got different kind of technologies and nerds get all involved in it and bitcoin's one and litecoin's one there's networks and there's blah 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 how does it work on the website is well it uses peer-to-peer technology also it's open source Its design is public. Nobody owns or controls VivaCoin, and everyone can take part. That's all. I love it. Where, no DeFi, where's my wallet? No blockchain. No anything. Just well, it's peer to peer. Just nothing. And it's Just open give us source. your money. Stuff. Just give us your money. Give yeah. us your fucking money. I think he's saying it doesn't really exist. Anyway, so the APRO action basically took a lot of effort to tell this bloke to knock it off and stop saying he's a bank. They won costs. They're never going to fucking see them. But he's so <laughs> much more than that. He's the liquidator and managing controller of the world. And honestly, I miss your but as APRA, what do you even do with that? What are you going to like do another <laughs> fucking federal court case that says, 
By the way, could well, you just be, stop calling there yourself There will that? be another federal court case, Joel, and that is to bankrupt this guy. Yeah, look, I don't think it's even going to touch the sides, to be honest. It'll probably just galvanise him. Look, I'm over the target. They bankrupted me. So it's good to see the <laughs> financial regulator. It's a terrible way to treat the managing controller of the world. It is. It is contempt. It is contempt of the highest order, and you know that he's going to be like, off to the Mongolian prison for you. APRA, I tried to warn you. I gave you a prisoner number. I, I set it all up for you. <laughs> now it. you've made You're your bed. You're not Justice Lee anymore. Yeah. Your prisoner one zero 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 seven zero one zero seven. Yep. Out of Mongolia. It's the only place for you. So it's it's cold in winter. Bring a jacket. So yeah, it well, is good to see the financial regulator isn't allowing these sort of shenanigans to happen. But like. It, what really happened? I mean, it did take them almost two decades to take this action. And what do they say? Stop calling yourself a bank, please. Like, it's not really going to work. So like I say, you know, I've really gone down this rabbit hole. I had about 50 tabs of people talking about Robert Gray's handiwork. And there's a lot to dive into. The stuff about Caledonia Australis is gold. There's all this weird shit about British Israelites and stuff. Fuck me. Unfortunately, with school and work, it's just not happening. But if I can find some time, I will make an hour of it. This will be yet another one of my many broken promises. There's a fucking litany of them, but it will take ages and I'm busy. Join the Patreon so I can quit my job. Anyway, in the meantime, the running tally for this week is Sovsit Zero, the man one. Now, mm. this is a running tally because we have more. More Sovsits. More Sovsits. You can never have too many. Let's see if they can make a comeback in the next segment. What do you reckon, listeners? Probably not. Probably not. You reckon? Nah. We fired you, we sacked you, we dismissed you as what? As garbage, because that's all you are. You're a criminal, you're a traitor, and you're going to the biggest barbecue in history. So from Christmas dinner to you are the dinner. Thank you, that's what I'll go with. Sovsit's running dodgy banks that aren't banks is one thing, but leave the bloody dogs out of it. Now, this odd thought came to me last week when I came across this, courtesy of the NZ news agency Stuff, albeit it was reported 18 months ago. Yeah, you know, news doesn't have to be current, it just has to be funny. So, a man aligned to the sovereign citizen phenomenon has failed to convince a court he should not have to pay dog res- registration fees because he declared his dog a legal person. Legal person. The man based his argument on an advertisement he put in a local newspaper. They love fucking doing that. But it was not enough to convince a high court judge that he should not have to pay up. That was evidence. That was evidence. What about the fucking ad? What about the ad? It's gazetted. It's been gazetted. (laughs) The curious case and judgment issued in August involves a man who goes by the name of James and his Hungarian Vizsla named Connor. Connor. Hmm. A Vizsla is, for those who don't know, and I had to look too, is a pointer. It's a oh. hunting dog, um, uh, reddish, or oh, sorry, orangey brown in colour, and certainly okay. that was Connor's colour. Oh, very interesting, Connor. So it's orangey brown and it's Connor. It's like a, a joke of the the whole Irish thing, you know, Irish redhead, right? Maybe. Right? I'm, th- I'm right? thinking. I'm thinking Terminator. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. John Connor, come yeah. with me if you want to live. Yeah, that's one of my favourite movies of all time. Fucking love it. The second one's way better. Wanganui District Council sent James a $50 bill, as in a bill for $50, in March 2020, not a $50 note in the mail, no, to no, register no. Connor, which he did not pay, leading him to getting a $300 infringement fee for failing to register a dog. The council then lodged the notice with the court, which effectively meant that it came a $330 fine. Oh, it grows. It's getting bigger. That- James filed paperwork with the courts in August 2020, claiming the case was one of mistaken identity. He claimed the person subject of legal action, him, was dead or a legal fiction, with the prosecution unable to continue without his consent. Classic. You see, and here we go, all soft-sit folks. We had a lovely little story of a shit pet owner refusing to register his dog, and then it goes all soft-sit fucked up. Uh Uh-huh. We love it. So James also claimed his dog was a legal person in the same way the Wanganui River was. Okay. Um, a pers- it's, it's a dog. It could be a river. It could be a river. Should have called it river. Would have been clearer. A per- this is a quote from James, I believe. A person does not have to register with a local authority to wear a collar or be restrained by a leash, he said. That's true. There's some That's true. real bondage vibes in that. 
And James also <laughs> took out an advertisement in a Wanganui newspaper in June 2020 in which he said Connor, born December 1st, 2019, was his private oh, property. That's a, that's a guess. Yeah, that mm. totally is. Was his private property but through the proclamation had become a person named Connor there James. There you go. It mm. was proclaimed. Yeah. So, so the dog is Connor James. Now, look, Joel. I quite like human names for dogs. Yeah, I like it. I like the name Steve. Steve, come over here. Steve. Yeah. I like the name Dave. I like the name Gary, but not Connor. Not Connor. You reckon? No, Connor's no good. No. My mate's actually got a cat named Dave, Vegemite Dave. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's, it's a good name for a cat too, Dave or Steve. Yeah. He's, um, he's a total Dave Steve. too. He's a fucking he's a hilarious cat. Yeah. You know, my dog's name's Lindsay, but of course that is after the wonderful character Lindsay Bluth in Arrested Development. Oh, and the cat is Lucille. Oh, she's um, Lindsay. After Lucille, the horrific yeah. mother. And I tell you what, the personalities do mirror the characters on screen. Yeah, so, so there you go. But we still James can't come at Connor James. No, no, it's not it's not happening. And it's the two a, names it's is, not a good is, name is, for a dog. A little bit weird. Well, that's, Although, that's that's the Dog person's surname, of course, is James. Yes. Well, to be fair, in defence, Liz's mum's cat is named Steve Holt. But uh, no middle name. Why wouldn't you give your dog a middle name? He's going to be. A, he's going to be human. Doesn't he get a middle name? It makes the passport look more convincing. Yeah. And better on the Centrelink forms when you inevitably claim benefits under his name. So James took legal action to get the fine quashed, but it was upheld in the Wanganui District Court in March 2021. So he went to the fucking high court to have the decision <laughs> judicially reviewed. The fucking was my editorial flair. What? So he claimed in the high court he was a sovereign person beyond the jurisdiction of the court. There I you mean, go. Jurisdiction. Textbook. Where's your jurisdiction? My dog's not driving. He's travelling. Oh, fuck off. So here's a bloke who gets a bill for 50 bucks <laughs> to register his dog. <laughs> And then it ends up in the New Zealand High Court. Look, I understand it's the New Zealand High Court. They, they probably they don't they don't have a lot to do, but well, still, you know, nah, fifty dollar nah. dog registration fees. Nah, how very self sit. The report goes on, Joel. Uh, the sovereign citizen phenomenon generally involves people picking and choosing which laws are valid to them, arguing common law is what governs them. Of mm. course, side note, they make up the common law yeah. and they just say that judgments it's say a thing law. when it's they common. don't. Mm. They don't say that. Some sovereign citizens will unsuccessfully argue in court that charges cannot be laid against them as they are not the person identified on charging documents. Classic. Instead, going by vaguely related names or concepts such as living entities. Yeah. He also also Strong claimed egg. the district court was a for-profit trading entity, classic, yeah. which required consent with people to do business. Business. Yeah, well, where do you where do you reckon all those court costs go, Jamesy old son? Sandwiches for the jury, usually. That's right. Straight on the Wanganui District Court's balance sheet, so it can continue to trade on the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> yes. I can see on the teller ticker here that the buy price of Wanganui District Court is fourteen cents a share, but I'm expecting it to go right up. And that's my hot ooh, like Vivacoin. My hot stock tip for the episode, listeners: go and get a pen. I'll wait. Wanganui District Court is on my buy list. Scrounge up all your cash assets and buy, buy, buy. Drop all remaining on my pause. Wanganui District Court currently trading on the New York Stock Exchange. Put everyone and their dogs on it. In yet another reminder that there is absolutely no justice in this world, Pete Evans has likely made a fortune recently on his Bitcoin investments. Now, I've always maintained that Pete doesn't really get economics and thinks no. that fiat currency is an Italian hatchback from 2005. <laughs> but the dark reality is that if Pete believes his own bullshit, then he has made out like a fucking bandit recently with the price of Bitcoin hitting 100,000 Australian dollars and basically doubling in under a year. We thought he was joining that B-list poverty queue when he put his Evolve Sanctuary retreat up for sale. We laughed. We laughed, we did. but I reckon I he just realised that he's got enough funny money to retire on and no longer needs to mix with the unwashed paws that come to his retreat on credit cards and mountains of afterpay debt. They always want and, you know, things like food and him. water and yeah. a place to toilet themselves. They're, they're just so oh, – they're just, they're just inconvenient. Well, that's the genius of the fasting retreat that kind of knocks all that shit out. <laughs> <laughs> Going to be a lot of shit, though. Going to be a lot Jesus. of shit. 
Yeah, that's your problem. Go in the bushes. So the reason for the surge in Bitcoin value is due to the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US granting institutional investors to the ability to bundle Bitcoin into these sort of exchange-traded funds, otherwise known as ETFs. These are very normal things. They're basically a stock you can buy that is made of a bundle of investments and it's managed by a fund. They take a cut and make sure that you and your mum have easy access to either widely diversified yet simple investments or bizarre niche investments Ooh, that would otherwise require expertise to invest niche. in. I'm liking it. I, I used one of those to bet against the American economy as a hedge on another thing and it really didn't go well for me. <laughs> God damn you, Biden. What won't you ruin? So Pete loves Bitcoin, not because he's a filthy capitalist, although he is, but he loves it because of the vibe. He's a rebel. Fuck the system, bro. Yeah, yeah. that's what he's saying. Yeah. But now the system just delivered him a doubling of his wealth. He may have changed his tune on Wall Street as a result. Or not. I don't know. I mean, some people are just ungrateful. Well, he's a part of it now. Yeah, he absolutely fucking is. So now don't get me wrong. Wall Street can eat a fart. I don't want to be here licking boots on that that street. I have zero time for predatory capitalism. And the way in which paper traders make a fortune doing nothing of value shits me to tears. Fuck that. But Pete... Pete has always fallen for the bullshit right-wing propaganda line that ever since BlackRock CEO Larry Fink said that diversity, equity, and inclusion, otherwise known as DEI, should be considered in their investment products, the white-knuckled fuckwit right have decided he is a communist and should be shot at from helicopters. (laughs) It is the same for Vanguard, a similar outfit, vicious capitalists that have also basically decided to throw some of this weird digital funny money into their mum and dad ETF products making the value of Bitcoin go up dramatically. So what's it going to be, Pete? BlackRock are one of the biggest investors in Bitcoin now. They're trading these ETFs of this, you know, sort of non-existent fake money. They're your mates now. (laughs) Take back all the things you've said because they just made you rich enough to no longer have to deal with weird people from strange, unpronounceable suburbs going up and eating all your grass-fed salmon and asking for second helpings of brisket. Yeah. Shitting all over the place. The recently deceased Jacob Rothschild, big believer in Bitcoin. Well, I mean, big speculator on Bitcoin at least. Jacob Rothschild. celebrated by cookers. Yeah, yeah. Died recently. Alex Jones couldn't get enough of it. Pete posted about it. You know, they're all fucking celebrating. He died of the jab. He would have died of the jab, wouldn't he? He would have had about 18. Yes, yes, exactly. He definitely died of the jab because he died and he exists. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've established Died it. suddenly. How old he was he? He died suddenly at 87 years old. <laughs> and look, I'm not saying that there's no reason to kick this guy in the face, but I am saying that I think the reasons why most people kick him in the face is because, A, his name is Rothschild. B, that name has Jewish bells attached to it. And C, they're all anti-Semites and fuckwits. But that capitalist pig dog can also get the bin for very different reasons to what these fuckheads are bleating about. Either way, Jakey Roths just helped... Paleo Pete make a bundle of money off these dodgy digital dollars he dabbles in. The cabal turns out pretty sweet pretty when they're good. on your side, right? Working Pete, out. right? Working out. Mm-hmm. Not so bad. Not so bad. Now, Pete's decided to pipe up more than he usually does on Telegram, and I fucking love Ooh. this. His days of sharing content without comment seem to be over. So this segment, thanks, Pete, will likely live forever. And it was it was on death row for a bit there. There was I was giving it my dazzlam. And this one. This one tickled me very pink. Ego death is a big topic that we have explored many times on our podcast, especially in relation to 5-MeO-DMT, in parentheses, toad medicine. Mm -hmm. The above podcast is well worth a listen watch. You can watch and listen. It is with Jeff Booth and Robert Breedlove. Ooh, he sounds good. I invite (laughs) you to watch the podcast that Robert and I did last year also. What is that? Fingers pointed skyward, three of them and three hearts. Well, he was referring to a post above. But well, I'm just going to clarify here that I've smoked DMT a shitload of times. It doesn't really do what Pete thinks it does, but I guess he just likes to elaborate on things. I must say I have done ayahuasca a couple of times and ego death is a huge part of it. Death itself as a concept is a huge (laughs) part of it. I've seen people who are absolutely being confronted with their death and possibly even experiencing it while you watch them just completely spack out. It's fucking wild. So DMT mostly for me has been like visuals, which is kind of cool. You know, well, that thing looks cool. The TV looks different. Ayahuasca. Ghouls Which everywhere. Which is DMT. In it. Yeah? Ghouls. Yes. Um, Ghouls but, everywhere. Spiders. Yes, it could, it could be. It could be. Black 
That's more meth. That's that's much more meth. <laughs> so ayahuasca is basically just DMT in a slightly different form. It lasts longer, blah, blah, blah. This sent me on a journey of self-understanding that I will never, ever forget. Now, I just need to clarify something here. That caption up there ah. was pointing upwards at this post. Ego death through Bitcoin with Jeff Booth. Uh-huh. In this episode, we discuss how we've got ourselves into the current mess. <laughs> This terrible current mess. Why Bitcoin is unstoppable and the importance of understanding ego, death, fear, and self-deception. Okay. <laughs> Got a long way cool. to go there, Pete. Anyway, Jeff Booth is the author of The Price of Tomorrow, Ooh, <laughs> available on Amazon, and CEO uh-huh. chairman of Ego Death Capital. Great. You'll so be, getting a, you you'll just... be getting a call from APRA as well, won't he? <laughs> yeah. Please don't I mean... call yourself a bank. Just fuck off, you know. Ego death through Bitcoin. Like, where do you even start with that? Honestly, it's it's insulting to the fucking madre uh, on that one. I just I'm embarrassed for him. So look, Pete, if you truly believe that taking DMT leads to ego death, then you maybe should hit the pipe a few more times, mate. Because Bitcoin's not going to get you there. It's funny money that you use to either get rich or share illicit materials. Just start licking toads, Pete. Just just grab grab toads up around the northern rivers and start licking the shit out of them. Mate, why is he getting it from toads? Get it from acacias like a normal person. Anyway, your ego is the size of a planet and the term malignant narcissist barely touches the sides of your toxic, shitty personality. And if Bitcoin is what need, you need to kill that ego of yours, then please fucking get on there, man. Buy, buy low, fucking sell high. Yeah, I expect his ego's dead now. No, it's Has really be, not. He's... No, no. Look at his telegram. He is an arrogant little shit. In the meantime, Bitcoin is going to save the world. El Salvador have implemented Bitcoin as a currency there and their reserves clearly just doubled in value. Wall Street are now crypto bros and the weird fringe-dwelling lunatics who think hashed equations are similar to gold and silver are now planning their retirements thanks to the fruity loot going to the moon. Mm. And pedophiles around the world are rejoicing as their ability to move money across borders without regulatory interference to buy child porn and captive children have overcome the final hurdle toward legitimacy. And their bank balances just doubled. Fuck yeah! Woo! <laughs> oh, hold hold on. Pedos, what? Pedophile? Oh, is that, a, is that a good thing? I don't know. As long as Pete gets rich, it doesn't really matter. It so he can keep matter. on buying his grass-fed yeah. salmon. Yeah, go Bitcoin, go Pedos, woo! And stop shitting in his house. You know, stop shitting around his property. And you have been listening to the Condition Release Program with your host, Jack the Insider, and Joel Hill. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. And if you've enjoyed our bullshit, throw us a five-star review on your podcast app. Get on with it. Jack, we found on Twitter on at Jack the Insider and Joel on at Crunchy Moses with AK. We set up a Facebook page you can find fairly easily. But promoting a podcast is easier said than done. If you'd share this episode, and we know you're not because we never see it, or a past episode that you especially enjoyed on social media, we'll be eternally grateful. It ticks things over. It keeps keeps things going. The Patreon is up and running, and we ask listeners to consider throwing a few dollars our way. Please do. For as little as $5 a month, you'll have access to all sorts of bonus content, and you'll feel warm and fuzzy for helping us out. Have we got the URL, General? It is, it is www.patreon.com backslash the conditional release program with a the at the front. Uh, and that's it, isn't it? I don't think anyone ever types it in, though. I think they just Google it. Ah, but if you want to go old school, type that shit in. Speaking mm. of old school, you'll have to type this one in. And finally, all feedback, tips, and death threats should be sent to the conditional release program at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you, even if it's to tell us that you've got a fancy piece of paper and you're going to buy BHP with a billeting with it. Good Do luck, it. mate. Tell us how you Do get it. Do it. Go for it, mate. Go. If they say no, sue them. <laughs> in take court. A, take your dog to the high court. <laughs> oh, fuck's sake. Thanks, listeners. See you next time. See ya. I don't think I ever want to talk to any of those people. Fuck me! You guys are bastards! <laughs>